Cooperative Hotel booking platform for business travel. And I want to talk to you today about how some of our clients who are in the construction industry have saved time and particularly money um, on their corporate travel uh, over the last number of years. So, as I said, we're hotel specialists, that's what we do. We don't do flights, we don't do car rental, we don't do anything else. But a lot of the stuff that I'm going to speak to you about today will apply right across the travel business as a whole. Um, so you can certainly um, extrapolate that across the industry. And I'm going to try and give you some real concrete examples that um, the big companies do, but there's absolutely no reason why smaller companies couldn't follow suit. Okay? So um, these are some of the companies that we work with. Um, given that we're in the hotel business, there's really no restrictions by industry as to who we can work with. But we find that construction engineering firms, manufacturing companies, food and drink companies, these type of guys um, really love what we do. Um, we really streamline stuff for them. We, we, we don't have any fees, so it's a free service. And they're able to put their projects, their um, developments through the system and track spend by project, by person, by booker, by all sorts of different stuff. Um, so the reasons that they use us, and this is really what I'm going to focus on today, are these four key points. Um, firstly, they want to save money, and really that's the reason that they start working with someone like us in the first place. But I think they very quickly realize when they get beyond the, the cost savings that there's the time saving is actually more important for, for the most companies. Um, and I'll touch on that in more detail. Um, we give them live reporting and that's something that whether you use our service or anyone else's, you should be looking for. You should be able to access data and you should be able to make decisions um, on your spend based on live information. And finally, um, you know, travel is an industry that doesn't have as many regulations as a lot of people who are, who are speaking here today. But there are things which I think um, each company that has people traveling um, either domestically or internationally and representing them, they really should consider because um, A, it's the right thing to do, but there is also um, consequences if it's not done properly. So um, I suppose before we begin, we get into those four points, um, maybe we should just think about why do we travel for work? I know in the construction industry it's it's fundamental. Um, you know you can't go and do a project unless you're actually physically there. Um, but there are statistics which will show that um, it's it's essential to just about every industry type. And um, this is a 2014 U.S. study, and that shows that for every dollar that's invested in business travel, there's almost a tenfold return on that. Um, companies do just think, well, maybe we can just do this online or maybe we can stop traveling as much. And they've seen instant drop off, um, which takes a long time to recover from. So, um, you know, if you're tendering, if you're going to meet someone, uh, I personally think, and I think the statistics will back it up, that it, if possible, it's best to go meet them face to face. Um, okay, so let's talk about how we can save money. Um, the first thing we would do when we sit down with any new customer of ours is ask them, well, where are you currently booking um, your hotels, in our case, but just about any other service? And let's see if we can squeeze those 10 hotels in Paris that you're using into two or three. Um, beyond that then, you know, is there a Hilton in, in Paris that you can use? Okay, well, can we use Hilton in, Ber in Berlin, in Birmingham, and London? And the smaller the scope of the suppliers that you can um, you can rely on, then the better deals you're going to get, and you can leverage the the business you, you can filter through to one supplier, um, or as few suppliers as possible. Um, really, is one way of driving down costs. Something that we're all familiar with in our own city is that you know if you stay in Dublin City, last night there was a. I think today as well, there's a huge conference on, there's 15,000 people in the city for, I think it's called Smack in the convention center. There was hotels last night at 400 euros, and that's just not the laws of supply and demand. Um, Dublin Airport last night was 240 euros. Uh, so again, hugely expensive, way more than what it normally would be. But even that small example, you can see that by staying slightly outside the city center, you're, you're getting a better deal. And 
something that people ask us all the time as well, when's the best time to book? Should I wait and see if the rates go down? Should I wait and see if they go up? And again, there's no one answer to that. Um, each hotel, really all hotels would have automated um, revenue management systems, which are really complicated paradigms that have things like, you know, past patterns, weather forecasts, um, events, all that stuff factored in. And they will, their job is to get every euro they can for every hotel room that they have available. And it, it's much like anything that has inventory that expires. So if you've got a cinema, if you've got a golf course with tea times, if you've got a hotel, an airline, anything that once that time passes that should have been used, it can never be used again. Um, it's in the interest of those people to get something for it rather than nothing. Um, so, you know, you will have last minute deals, you will have last minute offers, but our advice would be to book as soon as you know that the trip is necessary. And at least you have that as a starting point. Then if you see the rates drop, well, there's nothing to stop you cancelling and rebooking um, at a cheaper rate. Hotels um, are what we specialize in. We've half a million of them on our system, but the construction companies that we work with will, will tend to to go to a location for the first time, they will use hotels initially, but then they'll be looking for more long-term um, accommodation options, be it service departments, long-term lets, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, you hear a lot of talk about Airbnb now being an option, and, and for some people, in some circumstances, that is the best solution. Um, we just come back from Paris, where we stayed in an Airbnb on the, the weekend for the Ireland game, and now we're getting sticked from the, the owner that we didn't strip the sheets of the beds and put the rubbish out. So, you know, that's the sort of stuff that you need to consider. This isn't a hotel, this is someone's home. And if you've got guys in muddy boots walking in there, you're not going to be long before you hear about it. Um, so, the, there's all sorts of ways that you can buy a hotel room. And there's all sorts of people uh, selling them through all sorts of websites. And um, just be careful that, you know, cheapest rate you see is not necessarily always the best the best value to you. A key thing there would be if it's non-refundable, then you're stuck. Uh, if you need Wi-Fi, you need to build that in. If you need breakfast, you need to buy that in as well. So think of all those added extras. And I suppose the number one thing to look at for cost savings um, in travel would be, can I negotiate a rate? So we will do this all the time for companies um, who have a big demand at a particular location. And we'll go to that location and we'll tender for the suppliers there for the best rates we can get. So that would be, that generally goes right across the year at the same rate. So if you had a rate in Dublin and you had it for last night, you'd be doing well because your rate would have been lower than the 400 euros that the hotels were looking for last night. But on the other hand, in a rainy Tuesday night in February, the chances are that your rate's going to be higher than what you could get otherwise in the industry. So. What we do and what we would suggest that you do, whoever you work with, is you mix the fixed rate that you have with what other supply you can find around. And that way, you're, you're, you, know, you have your baseline, which you never go above because you fix that rate for the year. But if there are cheaper rates available, then you pull those in and you use those. Um, and that way, you're gonna ensure that you have a benchmark and you're always working from that. That's, that's, that those rate negotiations are, are, are really important, but. I suppose the holy grail here is, can I get the hotel to give me last room availability? So, you know, hotels will have X percentage of their stock allocated to corporates, and the rest they're using for John and Mary going on their holidays, and they're really pumping the rates up there. Um, unless you've got huge demand in a particular location for a particular hotel, they're not going to agree to that, because that, those extra last rooms are where the, the cream is, that's where they really make their money. So. Um, you know, you want to you have serious demand in any place in order for them to, to agree to that. Okay, so those are cost savings. As I said, um, companies often say that actually, yeah, cost savings are great, but the time saving here is what um, really encourages me to, to use a system like this. So, again, do we get everyone booking for themselves or do we identify the one person in the company and get them to make the bookings? So ups and downs of each, I suppose. If it's um, one booker, then you're paying someone essentially to book the travel for you. Um, if you don't do it that way and you have everyone booking for themselves, you don't have that expense, but you probably have a lot more expense because you've got guys who don't know what they're doing, spending 
stupid amount of time trying to find a deal that's saving them three euro, um, which isn't well time well spent. It's not their job, it's not what they're good at, it's not what they should be doing. So we would suggest, it doesn't have to be someone's full-time job, but certainly there's one person in the, in the organization who owns this project and who owns this um, process. As we said earlier, if you can get it through one supplier, one portal, that's gonna save you time. Um, you're not gonna have to surf endless amounts of websites. Uh, a thing that construction companies particularly love to do is allocate the bookings to a cost code as they go through the process so that that can then be billed on. Um, so you know that project X, you've spent this amount. If it's a big project and you've got, you know, you've got to be there for a long time and you're going to have a lot of people going there, then I would suggest that you get someone to go out there for a day, two days, have a look around, become familiar with the location because that's going to be invaluable to you. You know, you, my own, I stayed in London recently and I booked a hotel that was half a mile away from where I wanted to go. What I didn't realize was it was on the other side of the Thames. So in order to get there, I had to either go away around or get a boat across, which the last one was at midnight. And um, you know, that taught me a lesson that um, you really need to know where you're going if you're gonna be going there regularly. I suppose it's a given these days, but you, know, you need to be booking this live. It needs to be available when you need it and not at the back of an email. Um, there are still systems out there where you need to email people and they come back to you. I would, you know, we should be looking beyond that at this stage. And um, yeah, get those negotiated rates sorted out, get them in the system and make them live so you can book them when you need them. Okay, so point three or four then would be um, around management information. So a lot of companies, you'd be surprised how big companies in Ireland and beyond don't have any idea how much they spend on travel. And it can be a significant spend, but they just don't know. So if you don't know, you, don't, you can't make any decisions. Um, if you don't know, then you're really shooting in the dark here. So however it is you get it, if it, even if it's a spreadsheet that you keep and you type in the bookings that you make them um, and you have some visibility, then that's, that's something that you just can't over, overestimate. Um, and you know, the, the compliance bit here is about duty of care. So if someone's working in your office, then it's, you feel that you need to give them a comfortable work environment, you need to put the heating on, you need to give them tea and coffee facilities, you need to look after them. And if someone's traveling on your behalf, then that should be no different. Um, so they should be staying in hotels and that are approved, that are suitable for business travel. Um, you have a corporate responsibility in the UK, there's a Corporate Manslaughter Act, which we don't have here, but it's, even if we don't have that, you know, it's still the right thing to do. You need to look after people when they're traveling um, on your behalf. Because if you don't, this could be a small thing, really, in the big picture, like where was someone comfortable last night, but they will complain about it a lot. So, um, bear that in mind. And um, when you're introducing a system that uh, allows you to, to, look, to look after people, then you need to tell people why you're doing it and not just do it. Um, you need to involve the actual people who are doing the traveling, let them know why this is benefiting them. And, and they will, they'll, they'll, follow, they'll follow that, but as long as they feel that they've been involved in, the, in setting the policy from the start. Um, train them, educate them, explain to them why, why, it, why it works, why it's important. Um, we don't have to track their every waking moment, but we do need to know where they are tonight. So if there, tomorrow there's an incident in Paris, do we know, do we have anyone there? Is really the question here. And if you don't know that, then, you, you know, that's setting you up for trouble. Okay, so um, when you think about how you're gonna organize your travel, what, what system you're gonna use, write it down. Write it down and distribute it. And even a badly written policy is better than no policy. So, um, set expectations. Um, I say at the bottom there, you know, mandate the usage and be clear about this. This is not optional. This is not something you should do. This is something you must do. The company need you to do this. Um, you know, there's stories about guys who book outside policy, go off on their own, book their own flight, have a heart attack on the flight. Nobody knows where they are for days on end. And that's an extreme example, but you know, that could happen. If someone's doing their own thing and you don't know where they are um, and they're on your watch, then that, that's going to cause you trouble. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up by talking to you a little bit about the Sys Group, who are one of our long-term clients. Um, they 
came to us, so we, we, when we started working with them, they had invoices coming in from all over the world, uh, from projects left, right and centre, that no one really appeared to be sending off on, and it was mayhem. Um, it was taking them three or four days a month to reconcile all that spend. Um, we, they had no visibility, so they, they didn't know what was happening, they couldn't tell, and they had no way of knowing what a good rate was or what a bad rate was. Um, so we then came in, we sat down with them, we talked to them, and we moved all their spend through us, so now they get one bill monthly instead of hundreds. Um, the three, three days a month that they were using to reconcile is now half a day. The full visibility across departments, so they can tell at any moment what Project X in Berlin is spending as against Project Y in, in Madrid. And um, they can break that down by, by anything they like. So they, no, they, they know stuff, they can tell what spends there are and what demands there are, and they can make decisions based on that. You know, does this project make sense at this cost or not? And that's, that's great to know. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm gonna wrap it up. We're short in time, but we're um, stand 96, back corner there. We've got coffee on one side and the main stand on the other, so it's a good place to be. Thank <laughs> you.